lucky to have Trevor Pugh with us. Um, the title of today's lecture is Pediatric Immunogenomics, Landscapes and Immunotherapy, Pred Immunotherapy Prediction. And Dr. Trevor Pugh is a cancer genomics researcher and the director of the Joint Genomics Program of the University Health Network and Ontar Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Um, they, del they deliver basic translational and clinically oriented genomic services. He's also appointed as the associate professor at the, in the University of Toronto Department of Medical Biophysics. And he's a senior scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and a senior investigator at the Ohio Institute for Cancer Research. His lab is focused on understanding clinical implications of clonal shifts in cancer and non-cancerous cell populations during treatment. So welcome, Trevor. We're excited to have you here today, and we look forward to hearing your lecture. Thanks a lot, Jay, for the invitation and the introduction. Um, yeah, really thrilled to be a part of this, uh, this webinar series. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some work actually led by a postdoc in my lab, Arash Nabi, uh, collaborating uh, globally with Natty Jagger in, at DKFZ and Katie Hutchinson in Genentech. So there's going to be two sort of stories at play here. One, talking about what are pediatric cancer um, and what is an immunogenomic landscape, then trying to put this into practice and some forward thinking uh, ideas at the end of the talk based on what uh, on the data. So some disclosures, um, the most relevant for this talk is this, uh, we have some patents around a hybrid capture method for uh, determining T and B cell um, repertoire. So yeah, today I'm gonna talk about what is an immunogenomic landscape. It's a bit of a new idea. Um, we then wanna take that definition and sort of describe what do these landscapes look like? And how, what do they encounter? Um, what do they look like specifically in pediatric uh, nervous system uh, cancers? And if you want to look at many of the figures, uh, we've released those in BioArchive just uh, tail end of September, um, so it's available there if you'd like to read uh, in more detail. And then new work um, that is just currently under revision: an immunogenomic analysis of samples that were collected as part of the uh, the I Matrix uh, atezolizumab study, and that's the work with uh, Katie from Genentech. So yeah, I wanted to jump in and just talk about what is a landscape. And I want to start with this picture from Bob Ross, famous landscape um, landscape artist. And really, the I guess some of the, the complexities of using the word landscape, because there's so many different ways to describe a mountain, describe foothills. Um, there's interactions between water and the shore and soil and the beaches. So the spatial orientation and adjacency of samples is important. And all this complexity of looking at landscape paintings holds just as much for immunogenomics. So I flipped all the labels. So when we think about immunogenomic landscapes, we have to think of all the various pieces and aspects that go into an immunogenomic profile. So altered uh, functional pathway and signaling, this could be somatic alterations. It could also be uh, immune infiltration some of these um, interactions between immune uh, cells. Uh, how do we measure immune response? Lots of ways to do that. Um, I'm gonna talk about mostly genomic technologies. And then we can't forget the somatic cancer genome uh, that really kicks off, uh, kicks off the development of sometimes an abnormal landscape. So of course, cancer landscapes don't look like paintings. They look like tumors. So this is the exact same figure, but I've swapped out the Bob Ross art or actually, um, it's really nice art actually by Ben Wang, who leads the immune profiling group here at Princess Margaret. And now, rather than looking at trees and mountains, we're interested in chromosomes. We're interested in um, how pathways are activated, which pathways are being uh, used by both cancer and immune cells within a tumor, uh, measurements of those microenvironmental interactions. And I'll have several slides specifically on how do we measure immune response, and that's going to be using that um, that T and B cell repertoire sequencing technology. Um, so these specific technologies we're going to talk about whole genome sequencing, and this is really driven by uh, multiple and really excellent data sharing platforms and actually commitment from the pediatric cancer genomics community to make this data uh, widely available. Uh, same with whole transcriptome sequencing. Uh, so tissue-based imaging work. Uh, so this is immunohistochemistry with Paul Sorensen and H&E image analysis uh, with Derek Oldridge uh, at CHOP on Paul's in BC. Uh, and then some of the TCR and BCR receptor sequencing and even reusing some of the uh, existing uh, genomic uh, libraries that were already made for another purpose. 
the future is almost unquestionably measuring all of this using spatial single cell multi-omics technologies. And actually it's great to hear that uh, Claudia is gonna be giving a talk on that uh, because that all the work I'm gonna talk about is using bulk genomic analysis and trying to infer all of this information uh, from existing sequencing data from hundreds of, uh, of uh, pediatric nervous system tumors. And why do we want to do this? It's really this thinking, and certainly we've done a lot of work in the adult arena around using knowledge of the various immune components that make up uh, tumors to guide uh, selection and potentially development of different immunotherapeutic strategies. And this, um, this review actually does a great job of conceptually orienting different, different classes of immunotherapy. Uh, they, they use the term passive and active. Uh, passive is essentially providing missing parts. So if a tumor has evaded the immune system or has, um, has sculpted the immune system in such a way that it doesn't have any immune infiltration, you may want to consider different immunotherapeutic strategies compared to um, certainly the most famous immune checkpoint blockade, where you're reactivating existing components that are already in place. So that's sort of the framework overall, thinking about what makes up the, the immunogenomic landscape, but ultimately, what can we do about it once we've seen uh, that painting? So some more Bob Ross art. This is now multiple different pictures, multiple different landscapes. And the question we want to answer going in, what landscapes are encountered specifically in pediatric neuro nervous system tumors, which is an interest in the lab. So what is the paint? In this case, the paint is data sharing. Uh, RNA sequencing data from over 900 treatment naive pediatric tumors uh, across 12 different cancer types. We wanted to come up with a framework that could cut across different cancer types and really being driven by three different public data sets. Uh, CB, when we started the project, it was called CBTTC. Now it's the Children's Brain Tumor Network. Um, and I've listed all the websites here. Uh, great collaboration uh, with Natalie Jagger um, through the Ped Brain um, Tumor Project, and they're part of ICGC, uh, also with Stefan Pfister. Uh, and then a project I know very well from my postdoc days, uh, we went back to the well, um, looking at the neuroblastoma data from NCI Target. And here's the rough breakdown of the different cancer types across different cohorts, and I'll have different representations of different cancer types. Uh, you'll see some of these little codes throughout the project, and I'll try to call them out as we go into specific uh, cancer types. Uh, meningioma, um, schwannoma, ATRTs, ependymomas, um, MBLs, neuroblastoma, medulloblastoma. Uh, but we'll encounter some of these little codes uh, as we go through, and they're also defined in the bioarchive paper as well. Um, not to harp on the importance of data sharing, but this really could not have been done without the Cavatica platform. Uh, so they've done a really great job of housing and federating all of this data across multiple projects all into one place. We're able to essentially speak the same genomic language and have access to substantial compute to process these large number of samples. And I actually just pulled these numbers today from Gabrielle Miller, Miller uh, kids first. Um, just hugely impressive. Um, the storage footprint uh, and data footprint that they've amassed over there. Uh, I also want to acknowledge at this point Dragon Master, who paid uh, a large fraction of our uh, cloud computing bills as well. So that was a very important piece of support from them. Uh, we wanted to return in kind. So I put some links down here at the bottom where we wanted all of our work to be fully accessible and reproducible. So some links to the primary data in this um, specific workspace we've defined on the Kavatica platform access to the scientific computing code to reproduce all the figures that you'll see both in the papers and in this talk. Uh, and a new experiment for the lab, which is using Code Ocean, which essentially gives you a web accessible um, piece of code to essentially reproduce all the work uh, at a single click uh, within a web browser. So you have access to the data and the code all in one place. So yeah, I encourage people to check out uh, those as well. So into the science. Um, uh, data scientists' major number one job is data cleaning. So our first step was to make sure that we had, especially as we were bringing in cohorts across uh, multiple studies, we wanted to make sure that they were um, representing the same type of uh, same type of tumors. And this is just one exercise we went through with the CBTN tumors, um, specifically removing cell lines. We wanted to be focused specifically on primary tumors. In some cases, there were multiple tumors from the same patient. We only wanted one. Uh, we then only wanted primary tumors. We didn't want uh, any of these ser serial tumors specifically for the study. These are 
extremely interesting. We might actually be uh, looking at these as part of a follow-up study. We then wanted to focus on, on, I mean, all pediatric cancers are rare, but we wanted to have tumors that are some of the more common uh, pediatric tumors. So we want to have a sufficient sample size, then cross-reference these with um, pathology annotations that came along with each sample. And we ended up with 581 for CBTN uh, cohort uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and this is really why we wanted to share this data back uh, on the Cavatica platform, just so no one has to go through this uh, this, field, this uh, sample selection exercise again. And I just want to have a visual depiction of the effect of this. Um, so we took all the RNA sequencing data and did un, uh, unsupervised gene clustering. And down at the bottom here in uh, colored blocks are the pathology annotations. And you can see there's little gaps, there's little um, tumors that are not necessarily clustering it along with the rest of their cohort. And the effect of that filtration strategy was really to give us a nicely cleaned up. Um, I don't want to say it's a homogeneous cohort because there's a lot of texture within each of these cancer types, but at least we're doing we're doing an apples to apples comparison, and the pathology interpretation is totally in line with the uh, the transcriptional um, cancer type inference as well. So this is an important uh, upfront first step just to get all these data to uh, to play well together. So the goal here is immunogenomic landscapes. So we want to first define the parameters of immune cell infiltration. Which tumors have immune cells infiltrating them? Which ones don't? A lot of these are brain tumors. We're not expecting extraordinarily high infiltrate levels. Uh, and we're using tools that were not necessarily made or tested in pediatric tumors. So we want to use uh, this estimate immune score algorithm. Uh, this is widely used in the uh, bioinformatics community. And we did an in silico dilution series. So in this case, it was a medullobastoma uh, patient-derived xenograft, and we computationally mixed these with a, a healthy uh, spleen from the uh, genotype tissue expression uh, project. So we essentially did that dilution. So the percentage of immune reads or the percentages of reads from spleen. And what we wanted to do is generate this curve on the right that calibrated an estimated immune score to some estimate of the absolute number of immune reads present in each tumor. So that was an important upfront bioinformatics exercise, but then we were able to apply this curve across the entire cohort. So the y-axis here is percentage of reads mapped uh, to immune cell signal. Here are all the cancer types here along the bottom. And then we just put some adult uh, solid tumors, GBM probably the most uh, relevant given the uh, strong um, brain component in our cohort. Uh, but we just uh, gave that cohort essentially as a, as a secondary com uh, comparator group. Uh, and what we found were the highest infiltrate levels were in the extracranial entities, perhaps not surprisingly. Like we know the uh, brain is immune excluded uh, largely. Uh, but we're also able to recapitulate um, the work of other groups. So specifically, uh, ATRT having the widest level of variability. And that was what really struck me when I, uh, when Arash first showed me this plot was it wasn't like every tumor had a very consistent, tight immune distribution. These were extremely wide, both across cancer types, but also within uh, immune um, within cancer types as well. Uh, so ATRT um, actually just reported uh, just over a year, maybe two years ago, uh, that there are molecular and immune infiltration subgroups, and we believe we're seeing that in, in the data, and we'll go into that cancer type a little bit later. Uh, same story with, um, with neuroblastoma and ever tumors, just these high levels of variability, and really the benefit of unbiased immunogenomic profiling to get you a very quantitative measurement uh, using RNA sequencing data, and also the ability to compare across other cohorts like we did with the adults. Um, the other theme, and we'll return to this several times in the talk, is how important orthogonal validation is. And this is certainly an important part of, of putting together a manuscript, of doing discovery in, uh, in RNA sequencing data, but then validating it using uh, other samples and other technologies. Uh, in this case, we uh, teamed up with um, Paul and Alberto at the BC Cancer Agency. Uh, they had a tissue access to a tissue microarray from Children's Oncology Group, which they stained uh, for T cell and B cell markers. And we really found the exact same thing when you do quantitative analysis of these images. Uh, essentially highly variable uh, levels of infiltration in ATRTs. Uh, and same story here in the neuroblastomas. These are like highly variable uh, levels of immune infiltration, even pre-treatment. And if you sum all these H scores up across all the markers and compare them to the RNA sequencing, we see very similar patterns to what we saw using the RNA sequencing data as well. 
Uh, and really showing RNA sequencing is very good use of the tissue because you can recapitulate similar signal that you would get potentially from multiple sections of, of uh, often limited tissues as well. So what I just showed was overall landscape. So that's standing at two or three feet uh, away from a picture. We now want to zoom in and get into what exactly are these cells that are inhabiting these tumors. And we got a hint of it from that immunohistochemistry experiment where there were differences in T cell and B cell infiltration. Uh, so we then turned to some of our other uh, favorite immune inference tools. And we wanted to do that same calibration experiment like we did with the bulk, um, sorry, with, yeah, with the bulk uh, uh, immune estimate from the estimate tool. We now wanted to get much more granular down into individual cells. Uh, what kind of surprised us was these tools really didn't perform the same. They had different models. Uh, they had different reference sets associated with each gene. And doing that, that dilution series instead with bulk uh, immune reads, we now sprinkled in uh, immune reads specifically from purified B cells, natural killer cells, T cells, et cetera. And you can see just from these curves, they're not necessarily performing in the same way. Uh, and rarely do we get a very tight correlation between the ground truth, the reads we put in, and the uh, inferred method. Uh, and this has actually been well, uh, well explored by the authors of the timer, timer two algorithms. Uh, and surprising to us, most tools um, actually infer the presence of immune cell signal in uh, patient-derived xenograft samples. Uh, there is a risk here that we may be measuring some mouse content, but we're not getting that same signal across multiple different tools. And there may be uh, the risk that the cancer itself is expressing some of the marker genes associated with uh, each cell type um, used by these algorithms. And it's that last point that we really wanted to address. Is there a risk that the cancer cells themselves are confounding the immune cell signal, uh, the immune cell signal? So we set out to build our own set of genes that were still specific to immune cells, but they lack the expression in cancer cells. We wanted this to be truly, um, truly immune specific, but to avoid the confounder by specifically by pediatric cancer cells. Um, so this is a bit of a Herculean bioinformatics exercise, uh, mining the protein asset atlas, available single cell RNA sequencing data, um, the estimates already built or the, uh, the list of genes already built into existing algorithms. This got us a list of thousands of genes. We then restricted these to only the genes that are, um, that are being expressed in pediatric ner nervous system cancers, another round of filtering specifically for that cancer effect. And then we wanted to take those genes that are only expressed in immune cells, not in cancer cells, and assign them to specific cell types. And this was that last step um, looking at, rather than bulk immune expression, the cell-specific lists, but now filtering out all the genes that may be confounded by expression by pediatric cancer specifically. And at the end of the day, we arrived at these 210 genes that were specific to six cell types that we were confident we're going to accurately measure uh, immune infiltration and the subtypes uh, within the infiltrate and not be confounded, especially as we move across all the different pediatric cancers uh, in our cohort. And so what did we find? We ran these same tools. We now have our own new list of genes, uh, list of cell types, uh, essentially using this list of high quality genes. And what we found were these four broad immune clusters. Uh, pediatric inflamed, myeloma or myeloid predominant, immune neutral, and immune excluded. And here's the breakdown of different cancer types uh, down here uh, in the heat map at the bottom. So in general, there were specific cancer types, um, meningioma, schwannoma, et cetera, that were more either pediatric inflamed or myeloid predominant. And down, down the left, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, famously not overly well uh, immune infiltrated uh, and scoring low or scoring high, but rather for the immune neutral, immune uh, excluded cell type or um, immune subtype. Um, so return to that uh, need to validate. So we turned to Derek Oldritz at CHOP and we wanted to validate these immune uh, clusters. And in this case, he had to just set up a really great framework to do um, quantitative image analysis of uh, H&E slides. So we had 355 of these. These were all being shared through CBTN uh, and was able to give us a very quantitative um, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte score. So we had pictures like these with high levels of infiltrate, moderate levels and low, and essentially recapitulated what we've seen from the RNA immune inference um, immune inference story. Essentially the two groups that are associated with high inflammation 
You also see exactly the same signal when you don't grind up the cells when you have them on the slide. Um, and there's um, and these differences were, were uh, statistically significant. You can also see by the color here; these are all different cancer types being populated across uh, across each of the immune subtypes as well. So those didn't turn out to necessarily be a confounder. And that was the goal of the whole study: was to come up with an immunogenomic framework that could cut across cancer types. Uh, that being said, we did want to look at the molecular subtypes within specific uh, cancer types. So I mentioned this ATRT finding from a few years ago, Marcel and Cool, Marcel Cool and others. Um, we essentially uh, were able to recapitulate that finding. So specifically, this highly infiltrated, um, highly immune infiltrated uh, MYC, uh, MYC and uh, TYR subtypes. Um, we stratified neuroblastomas into not amplified and amplified, very different representations of the immune uh, subgroup, subgroups there. So the uh, high-risk MCAN amplified cases not having high levels of immune infiltration, and so on and so forth. So it was really an opportunity to take the somatic genetics and put it alongside um, the immune subtypes. Uh, that being said, it wasn't a lock and key. It wasn't like there was a subtype and you were guaranteed to have runaway T-cell infiltration or B-cell infiltration. So the association is imperfect. So while there's sort of a trend towards specific uh, patterns of immune infiltration, given your somatic, um, your your somatic cancer genome, it's not it's not a rule. It's it's a little messier than that, uh, and it's really why it's quite important to profile both the cancer genome, but also the immuno um, the immune um, infiltrate uh, together and side by side to get a complete picture. Of pediatric tumors. Um, we did look at some other potential uh, sources of differences uh, in uh, different distributions across the immune subtypes. Uh, and really, the only thing we found was that these immune excluded tumors were enriched uh, in tumors from males. And we don't have any causation here. We don't know whether this is because there's specific immune cell subtypes associated with being male and therefore developing immune excluded tumors. Um, we did also check um, ethnic background. We really didn't see any differences in distribution across the um, across the immune subtypes there, and we didn't see a difference across uh, at age of diagnosis. So really, returning to that idea that there's not one necessarily external feature that dictates where a tumor is going to develop or fall within these uh, four immune sub uh, subgroups, uh, apart from being male, which may have some additional confounders, uh, especially cancer type or cancer location. Uh, another famous biomarker, certainly in the immunotherapy world, is tumor mutation burden. Uh, in our hands, tumor mutation burden as a continu continuous variable wasn't associated independently with each immune subgroups. Um, so just showing here, uh, essentially um, looking only at single nucleotide variants, including the indels, no big difference across the four groups. Where there is a difference is when you look way up at the extreme. So these really, really high mutators, pediatric cancer is famously low mutation rate cancer. Uh, but if you look at these really high mutators, you do see that enrichment specifically for the tumors that do have uh, immune enrichment. Um, so tumor mutation burden is very helpful as an extreme biomarker when you're above a specific threshold. But these subtleties, especially in these low mutation rate tumors, uh, TMB really wasn't necessarily sculpting or associated with um, any of the four immune subgroups. Uh, and similar story for driver mutations. We looked at all the driver mutations, and over here on the right, we've actually classified them into various um, various uh, pathways. And essentially what we saw were these driver mutations cut across cancer types. They cut across um, the immune uh, the uh, four immune subtypes. Um, so we really didn't see a relationship between what was actually driving the tumor and the ultimately responsive uh, immune microenvironment. Uh, and this perhaps isn't necessarily that surprising. Driver mutations are not do not that frequently actually encode neoantigenic peptides, and in some cases, actually, it may not even be um, mut mutant uh, trans mutant peptides at all. They're actually driving an immune response. There may be more likely that some of the signals coming from uh, out of context expression of uh, non mutant sequences, such as um, cancer testis antigens or other transcripts that may be abnormally expressed. So we didn't really weren't able to really draw a direct line between uh, the presence of mutation and the development of any of these four immune subtypes, and that's kind of why this heat map is a essentially a random checkerboard pattern. 
uh, we did want to understand what was driving these uh, these gene sets. So we took the the um, the gene list associated with each of these four types, and we essentially asked what pathways are these genes encoding, and really turned up several pathways that have already been associated with positive immunotherapy outcomes. So these are all pretreatment tumors. They're not um, they're not treated. So we actually don't have any knowledge of immunotherapy outcomes for any of these patients. But we are seeing pathways like interferon gamma, which are which is one of the most robust uh, signatures that held up very well as a predictor of uh, positive immunotherapy outcomes, um, which speaks promisingly specifically for the pediatric inflamed uh, cohort. Uh, potentially thinking about using some of these signatures to select patients specifically for uh, immune checkpoint blockade. And I'll return to that story when we get to the second part of the talk. Um. Going back to the need to validate all this, there was a, some really nice work uh, using uh, spec, uh, mass spectrometry uh, analysis of the same tumors that are also in um, uh, were also in our cohort, and we essentially saw the exact same thing. The same signal that we saw using the RNA subsequently validated, and so essentially you see a rightward shift of essentially the proteins associated with all of these pathways. Uh, specifically in the pediatric uh, inflamed and the myeloid uh, predominant subtypes relative to the two uh, colder uh, cancer, uh, the two colder uh, immu immune microenvironment subtypes. We now want to drive even further. So we looked at total infiltration, we looked at cell types, we looked at pathways. Now we want to look at individual genes. Is all this being driven by one or two genes? The answer there is essentially no. Um, so we did gene set specific analysis uh, on each of the four subtypes. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, pediatric inflamed, runaway upregulation of cells associated with B cells and granulocytes. Uh, myeloid predominant, actually only one hit in this population being overexpressed, specifically macrophages, so associated with the myeloid, uh, with the myeloid lineage, and the flip. When you get to immune neutral, down regulation of J-chain B, uh, B cell associated genes, uh, and immune excluded, down regulation of granzyme of uh, granzymes J chains. Um, so really, the story is being uh, supported in multiple different ways by looking at this data through uh, multiple different uh, different lenses. And here's the heat map of various genes along the bottom, um, really being driven largely by what immune cells are infiltrating these tumors. Um, so most clinically relevant, what about survival? Um, so these weren't quite as clear in this case. Uh, this is confounded a little bit by the fact that these uh, tumors, despite potentially sharing common immune profiles, are all being treated and staged in totally different ways. Um, so this is going to need probably a cohort by cohort analysis or potentially trials testing each of these individual survival patterns. Uh, but we were able to conclude, uh, to conclude the infiltration of specific myeloid patterns provide a greater survival advantage than generalized hyperinflation of multiple cell types or low, uh, or low infiltration overall. Um, so really what you want is a very targeted anti-tumor response. Uh, and there's a bit of a question of whether these signatures are going to be prognostic or could they be used in a predictive way if you're able to intervene specifically with a, a cancer immunotherapy as well. And that's the type of use we'd like to encourage from this data set. Could you predict or use some of this thinking around uh, patient selection for a potential future uh, clinical trial? Um, we want to go beyond individual genes and specifically try to understand not just T-cell function, but also the T-cell repertoire. Uh, so this is where my um, declaration of conflict of interest came in. We invented this uh, hybrid capture-based method uh, that essentially, rather than using PCR to amplify T cell receptor loci, uh, uses uh, hybrid capture baits against the uh, essentially the uh, portion of the J region right next to a rearrangement as these T cells uh, as these T cells mature. Depletion of um, of the surrounding non rearranged signal um, uh, part of the genome, and then V capture. And what we want is this little molecular barcode that includes the V, the J, the V, the D, and the J which essentially confirm the antigen specificity of these T cells. And at the end of the day, um, that gives us these little sequences with a B, a BDJ um, combination. And we can count those to infer the diversity of T, cell, uh, T cells uh, infiltrating a tumor, but also the presence of specific clones that may be expanding and potentially be anti-tumor. 
Uh, the other reason we liked hybrid capture is we're able to uh, apply hybrid capture to existing DNA and RNA sequencing libraries. So we don't have to go back and get more tissue. We can just take libraries that already exist, and potentially generated for another reason, lift out the TCR sequences, uh, and um, do a clonality and a diversity analysis. Uh, we actually just had a paper come out yesterday in Life Sciences Alliance, the exact same idea, but applied to the immunoglobulin or the B cell receptor um, loci as well. Um, so another technology that we, then the dream is we'll combine all these base sets together and get a complete T and B repertoire in a single experiment. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to talk about the TCR uh, repertoire. So we had all this bulk RNA sequencing data, and we wanted to uh, compare that to our CAPSEQ data. And essentially, we saw a relatively good correlation when the diversity was very high. So if you have a lot of low-frequency polyclonal T cells, uh, and we see them in our deep CAP TCR sequencing data, that's essentially recapitulated in the RNA sequencing data. Where the RNA sequencing data falls down a little bit is when you have a clonal expansion, because the RNA sequencing is it's relatively shallow at the T cell receptor uh, locus. So you're only sampling at the very, very top of the repertoire. So you don't get this full diversity metric. But we were confident that we were able to separate clonal from polyclonal infiltrates. So whether we, um, our, our challenge is whether we could really pinpoint precise measurements of diversity, but we were able to say this tumor has a more clonal infiltrate uh, than some of the others. And here's the output of applying the um, the immune, the TCR um, diversity inference to the RNA sequencing data, and really reflecting some of what we already knew from the uh, immune infiltration levels. So neuroblastomas being highly variable, but also having a mixture of very clonal uh, infiltrates and very uh, polyclonal or oligoclonal infiltrates as well. Uh, and this is what some of the real data looks like. So if you look at the Shannon diversity and map it to the number of reads, one concern we had was is it just the number of reads that are driving clonality? And there is some relationship there, but off of the diagonal, there are a large number, in this case, we've called it all the neuroblastomas, that even if you have a large number of uh, TC, reads mapping to, uh, to TCR, the diversity is not there. So these are the clonal populations. And contrast that to some of these tumors, also with middling levels of uh, mapped RNA sequencing reads, but almost every read mapping to a different TCR sequence. So that really gave us the ability to distinguish these polyclonal from clonal infiltrates. And probably like you'd expect, the uh, pediatric inflamed basically have a large amount of immune infiltrate, and it's not clonal. It's a ton of many, many different T cells that are inflaming these tumors in a generalized way. Uh, myelite predominant, these are slightly less diverse and not surprisingly um, very hard to find TCRs uh, inhabiting the immune excluded and the immune um, we call it the immune neutral. Uh, if you just look at the um, compare neuroblastoma to the uh, CNS tumors, there's a marked difference in the extracranial versus the cranial. Um, so really the context actually matters uh, quite a bit here with uh, almost an order of magnitude, fewer TCRs found in the CNS versus in the extracranial tumors um, due to the CNS being immune protected. And these are some of the conclusions from this uh, from this first paper, the uh, the one out on bioarchive. So we have four immune microenvironments broken down across these different percentages. Uh, TMB on its on its own in the low mutation and uh, the low mutation rate tumors uh, was not independently associated with the inflamed microenvironment. Um, we hypothesized that pediatric inflamed tumors may be good candidates for ICB. Uh, and the myeloid predominant may actually benefit specifically from this disruption of myeloid and lymphoid interactions, because these, the microenvironments of these myeloma, of these uh, myeloid predominant tumors were a mixture, not just the T cells, but also other myeloid uh, lineage as well. And we have, did sort of note there is an anti-CD47 um, therapy actually being trialed, uh, listed on clinicaltrials.gov now. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to do a biomarker analysis of that cohort. Uh, to see if this hypothesis holds up. Uh, on the flip side, the immune neutral and immune excluded actually may not be the best candidates for immune checkpoint. The parts to the maintenance not be in place to reactivate. Um, and one strategy could be to accelerate movement of these patients into biologic uh, immunotherapies to put the parts back in, adoptive tra cell transfer or CAR T. Uh, the other take home from that study was really there's few clinical surrogates for the immune subgroups. There's that very slight enrichment of uh, of males with immune excluded tumors. 
Um, but what we really learned from the study was how important it was, just like we've been doing for precision medicine for cancer mutations, it's equally important to have a personalized immunogenomic profiling and really have these two pieces of data side by side uh, as part of a complete uh, cancer or tumor uh, genome profile. So the second, so that laid the groundwork for our thinking of immunogenomics in pediatric and actually in uh, adult tumors as well. We now want to take those landscapes and know which of the features within those landscapes, which of those pictures had the mountain that would tell us whether uh, kids are likely to respond uh, to immune checkpoint blockade. Uh, and this is where the collaboration with Genentech and Katie Hutchinson came in, um, really building on this um, fairly exciting, actually, phase one, two clinical study of atezolizumab. Uh, for kids, and just like our original cohort, a mixture of tumors, solid tumors, lymph uh, and Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphomas. Um, put the consort diagram just here on the left, so a fairly large study. Um, responses were not overwhelming, um, but it was an opportunity for us to try to understand why some of these patients uh, were responding. Uh, and they actually put right in the abstract, they wanted to, this data set to be uh, used and inform potential new um, patient selection methods. So it was really conceptually uh, and um, a very exciting uh, opportunity to look at some of these tumors from patients on this trial. So in the iMatrix study, they'd done pdl one tumor expression. They'd actually already identified that as a biomarker of response. Uh, they also flagged that it was a challenge having this mixture of lymphomas and solid tumors. And that's something we uh, uh, encountered when looking at the matched RNA sequencing data for these uh, for these uh, tumors as well. Uh, the other benefit in this study has been um, the existence of some immunohistochemistry data that we're also able to analyze <clears throat> alongside um, some of the other biomarkers that have already been developed. So yeah, we took a look at that immunohistochemistry data, very similar to as was done in the first uh, landscape paper. And we found there was real value in scoring out specifically the, um, the, the C, uh, T cell markers. So essentially the patients with high CD8 uh, protein expression, both across the cohort, but also um, excluding the tumors um, that were taken from lymph nodes, uh, lymphomas, uh, we're still seeing this strong uh, survival signal. Uh, the challenge with this study, just to draw your eye to the bottom, these are small numbers. So we are, we're really thinking of this as a pilot study and um, to essentially point us toward leads and help us validate some of our work in the uh, the landscape uh, in the landscape paper as well. Um, just as we did in the, the first paper, we applied the immune inference uh, methods, uh, applied them to the RNA sequencing data, and essentially recapitulated very similar um, survival curves, both in <clears throat> using across the entire cohort, but also uh, when excluding uh, lymph nodes. Uh, and likewise, the PDL1 was already well established in that study, strong uh, survival association with that specific marker, but also the ability to read it out uh, from the RNA sequencing data as well. So really the opportunity of, of even bulk RNA sequencing as a, bit, as a major opportunity to um, score out and um, assess multiple biomarkers from a single data set. Uh, TCR sequencing, just as was done in the, the first paper, uh, we were able to generate this TCR uh, landscape using CAP-TCR-seq, in this case, uh, applied to DNA from the baseline uh, tissue samples. You can see huge diversity over here in the lymphomas. Not surprisingly, they're sort of, um, coming from the, these lymph nodes. And then this diversity of different uh, immune uh, infiltrate levels. So these ones down here on the left, uh, low levels of diversity, so clonal uh, infiltrates. And this one on the end, almost looking like a lymph node, just highly, highly polyclonal. Uh, infiltrate um, invading this tumor. And we want to ask the question, is TCR uh, diversity um, uh, a useful biomarker uh, in this context? And actually, indeed, it was. So TCR diversity at baseline, independent of a tezolizumab response um, across the entire, both across the entire cohort, but even in the uh, cohort once you take out the lymph nodes. But also, yeah, just be cautioned, not many responders in this study, but we were able to identify the patients with low diversity um, really um, not benefiting very much at all uh, from a tezolizumab uh, treatment. So really a brand new biomarker uh, because large numbers of samples had been banked and were available for molecular analysis uh, uh, as part of the trial. 
And very similar story. So we every time we look, we uh, under a rock, we sort of uncover a very similar uh, immunogenomic story. In this case, a differential gene expression between responders and patients with progressive disease. Again, that interferon gamma response um, pathway popping up over and over. Uh, so in this case, not just a prognostic um, marker, but potentially predictive in atezolizumab as well. And differential gene expression really driven very strongly by genes associated with uh, immune infiltrates. So the take home from this follow-up study, uh, immunogenomic analysis linked a lot of these potential biomarkers to atezolizumab response across pediatric cancers. This is a re reality of a lot of these pediatric cancer trials. They're not necessarily going to be uh, homogenous populations and really the need for analytic frameworks that cut across different uh, cancer types. Uh, what we really learned was the multimodal approach is very powerful. It's hard just to look at immune cell or an immune pathway or just a driver mutation uh, and really, it's the combination of immune cell infiltrates measured potentially multiple ways, protein and RNA sequencing, um, and looking at novel biomarkers such as T-cell receptor diversity as well. Uh, and similar to the first paper, how powerful the uh, poll is for personalized immunogenomic profiling. Uh, and the, the, what we really need to do to bring these two studies together is to take the four subgroups that we found in landscape paper and start to test those out in clinical trials, including this cohort here, and ideally uh, larger cohorts as well, uh, as samples are banked and profiled. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of future directions before I wrapped up. Um, really where we're going locally here in Toronto is supporting some Pan-Canada Precision Medicine programs. Uh, the BC Cancer Agency has set up this, um, this protocol called Captivate, where they essentially score out four different aspects of the immune microenvironment, similar to as we uh, evolved in our uh, immunogenomic study. And um, here at Princess Margaret, uh, Lillian Sue is leading a Marathon of Hope Cancer, uh, Cancer Center Network uh, O network. And essentially the idea is to have not just genomic profiling, but also immunogenomic profiling as part of the assignment to patients to both captivate, but potentially some other clinical trials that are gene expression or immune cell inference uh, driven. Uh, and to support that, the genomics program uh, I lead at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research has undergone uh, CAP and Accreditation Canada accreditation, uh, specifically for clinical reporting of whole genome and RNA sequencing. Uh, and we set this up, I just showed our, a little example of our clinical report on the left. Um, we set this up originally for reporting mutations, fusions, and cup number alterations, but really where our activity now is moving towards this validating genomic landscapes for clinical reporting. And that's not just tumor mutation burden, um, which we already report, but other more subtle signatures that do sculpt the microenvironment, like microsatellite instability, homologous repair deficiency, uh, immune deconvolution, some of the cell-specific uh, immune inference methods. Uh, that I mentioned um, throughout this talk. Uh, and really, this is really where I see clinical molecular testing has to go. It has to be comprehensive, and it has to be multi-omic, in this case, genome and RNA sequencing, because really only together that you get the, uh, the full view uh, of these immunogenomic paintings. So um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, full credit to Arash and Abby, who's really driven the relationships, the bioinformatics, the sample movement uh, at the heart of both of these uh, studies, and to really co uh, call out the co-PIs, uh, Nelly Jagger on the, the first study, great collaboration with the DKFZ team, uh, collaborations with uh, Derek Paul and Alberto, uh, and the other co-PI for the iMatrix uh, I -Matrix paper, uh, Katie Hutchinson uh, and the Genentech team and a rich and, uh, and long-standing uh, collaboration with David Malkin and the uh, Precision Oncology for Young People uh, program funded by Terry Fox at the Princess at uh, across Canada. So thanks very much, and I'm happy to take questions at this point. Thank you very much. Um, I have some questions of my own, but I'm going to start from a few that have come in. Um, this is a, a multi-parter, but um, the first one is, were there correlations between immune filtrated tumors and immunotherapy outcomes? Yeah, so that's the issue with the uh, sample with the first paper. It was focused on primary tumors. Uh, some of them were collected way before immunotherapies were even available. So we don't have immunotherapy outcomes. Our only uh, shot at that currently is that iMatrix study where we had a distinct clinical trial where we were able to make those inferences. I 
believe there's probably the opportunity to link all that banked data. This might be a question for Kabatica or the CPTN group. Is there a way to link that information and update the clinical data in case some of those uh, kids did go on to cancer immunotherapy trials? So I suspect some of that data may be out there in some database somewhere. It's not sort of in the default um, annotation table that we got, but I think there's an opportunity there for a refresh of the clinical data in case some of those patients did go on to a trial. Um, next question, have you looked at non-responsive hot tumor um, immune signatures? Yeah, so these are very interesting. And you probably, you might have seen them on some of the plots. There are these huge outliers that um, don't necessarily have diverse T cells. So they have a very, they have a very high immune content, but they're different from the other tumors with high immune content. Um, so we don't have response data, but I think that is a very interesting subclass, essentially the tumors that that break the mold of this pan cancer uh, analysis. So we haven't looked at response, but to me, that's the whole point to be doing uh, comprehensive profiling to identify those really um, biologically unusual tumors and to see if potentially they together might be a, an unusual uh, subset that you could go after therapeutically. Um, but yeah, we didn't have response in that first uh, cohort, so uh, we couldn't make that correlation yet. Um, do you see T cell exhaustive signatures in the hot tumor, hot tumor population? We didn't score that out specifically, um, and we were a little confounded early on because some of the gene sets overlap genes that were being expressed by pediatric tumors. So I think to go after that question, we're going to want to go through a similar exercise of are the exhaustion signatures overlapping with pediatric cancer cell expression profiles? Um, so yeah, it's a great idea. I agree. It probably will be a prognostic signature uh, and it might actually might help us tease apart. Uh, I think the piece I'm still confounded by are those survival curves where you have very good PFS and immune infiltrated, but then they don't do very well uh, long-term. And I, I think questions like this might help us uh, understand why that is. Um, do you, do you think this could be a prognostic signature for, for immuno? therapy responsiveness. Yeah, I, I think it likely will be. Okay. Um, Brian Crompton asks, should we just add your probes to the tumor specific panels being developed for paired tumor uh, circulating tumor DNA analysis? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I mean, that I would love to do that. I we don't have the data yet, but I suspect that the tumor reactive T cells are probably enriched in the cell free DNA. Um, so, yeah, it'd be great to team up with you to do that. I think that's where the signal is going to lie in the cell free DNA. Uh, the other exciting part with cell free is the pragmatomics analysis, uh, reading out not just cancer cells, but also open chromatin regions associated with, um, with immune cells, with T cells and B cells. So there's a lot that can be done with genome-wide cell-free DNA profiling. And yeah, with, I think baiting out TCR signatures and cell-free DNA would be a pretty interesting experiment. Uh, another question, comment come in. Very nice talk. Um, can you compare the amount of immune infiltration in the pediatric inflamed group to traditionally hot adult tumors like melanoma? Are they inflamed in general or inflamed relative to other pediatric tumors? Yeah, it's super variable. So there are some tumors that are inflamed to the same level as an adult melanoma and some that aren't. So it's a complete gradient. Um, so I, pediatric inflamed in our case are in general around the average of adult tumors, but you can tell by those huge spreads on that first colorful immune plot, they stretch all the way up to an ultra hot melanoma-like microenvironment. Um, but in general, pediatric tumors are colder uh, than most uh, adult tumors. Uh, another question just came in. It says, given that the different sorting methods lead to different results, how how do you know which method truly reflects data generated from the protein levels? Yeah, it, this is a great question. It's super tricky, especially in um, genomic test development. What really is the gold standard? Because um, are we going to benchmark to something that is totally different? We're doing DNA and RNA. It's already well established that correlation between RNA and protein is not necessarily perfect. It held up well in our hands for a select set of proteins. 
Um, to me, the proof has to be in clinical outcomes. Um, it has to be in measuring a molecule, however you do it, and then showing that that actually has an impact on, on patient, um, patient care and patient outcome. So at the end of the day, I don't know if we need to strive for a perfect correlation between all of our biomarkers, but we do need to evaluate all of them in an unbiased and comprehensive way. Um, so we do have that, that baseline calibration. That's why we, did, we set out to do so much of that validation, not necessarily at the single gene or single protein level, but often at the cell type or the um, gene pathway level. Um, the questions I had were, what do you think it's going to take for this to become a standard of care? It's going to have to be show some clinical utility. So for that, you're going to have to bake these strategies into clinical trials. Um, and there's going to need to be a lot of infrastructure. So the real challenge is putting genomes and RNA sequencing uh, into practice. Um, right now, certainly clinical genetics is really in gene panels, but costs are really continuing to fall. And it's actually becoming cost effective to start to be doing genomes and RNA sequencing uh, quite routinely, even on clinically derived specimens. Um, so yeah, I really encourage partnership between clinical lab geneticists and oncologists to set up and scope out those, uh, those tools uh, and to encourage something that already happens in pediatric cancers a lot, which is data sharing and multi-site studies. Um, this is the best part of clinical lab geneticists are these like sample sharing and knowledge sharing across clinical labs who deploy these tests. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, it's happening now. Certainly a, a lot of our adults trials are really trending quite quickly towards genome and RNA sequencing. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's going to be infrastructure and uh, partnerships to really make it happen for pediatric cancers as well. I mean, it seems like it's probably years away. Um, but what do you think I think I would say it's single digit years. I don't single digit years. This is not decades in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I think we failed if it's going to take that long. Um, but yeah, it's it's not next month. I think I'd concede that. Do you think there's a even a, a bigger lift to get this to be a standard of care in like a, a regional or a community hospital rather than a major urban hospital? Yeah, this is where. Um, relationships between hospitals and reimbursement are really going to come into play. And this is where it's very stri striking context contrast between different uh, jurisdictions. Um, at the end of the day, it's just another molecular test. Um, and that comes with all the current barriers that we already face for targeted gene testing. Uh, I don't think even gene testing is all that widely available. So that's a problem to solve totally independently of the genomics platforms is how do you open up access, not just to drugs, which is already a challenge, but also open up a challenge to diagnostics. And when you do have a finding, how do you get a kid onto the right, uh, that right drug? So there's actually two access problems to start solving yeah. basically now. Yeah. I mean, so if you run, run this on, on a patient and, and it comes up to, that they should get a drug that's not available at their hospital, right? So then you have to get them to a hospital that has that drug on trial. Yeah. And that's where these data networks are so important because it's knowledge of what have you found and then what trials are actually available. We don't really have Google search for, here's a tumor, what trial could I go on? Like that, that's actually a pretty interesting piece of infrastructure that, uh, that really needs to be built. And then, you know, isn't the insurance company going to want to pay for the family to travel? you know, a thousand, 2000 miles to get the drug, or is it going to be on the shoulders of organizations like Alex's when our travel, we have a travel for care fund that will get families there, but I could see it getting quickly overwhelmed. If, if, you know, if, if we have to, you know, 10 X number of families that we're helping travel. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak to what insurance companies will reimburse, <laughs> but to me, it's money well spent. If you really have an extraordinarily highly predictive biomarker and this drug's been known to work uh, with very high likelihood, uh, to me, it's, it's going to be money well spent. I agree. So I don't know if you planned it this way, but our timing has been perfect because we're out <laughs> of questions and we're out of time. <laughs> um, oh, another question just popped in. So maybe you could take one more. With this, 
would this need immune infiltrated signature around the tumor in a parentheses biopsy, or would you be able to do the same with peripheral blood sampling? Yeah, I think that loops back to Brian's question. I think it's in the blood. I have no data to back that up, but mm -hmm. from what really, really early work in adults and what's being done with fragmentation data, I think we're going to be able to get it in the blood and to see it over time, which would be really exciting to know, is this there, is this original prediction working early, like much earlier? Uh, and we, we do have some data that shows cell free DNA signal precedes imaging signal. So you could really get quite creative with cell free DNA plus imaging as both a, a predictor, but also as a monitor uh, over time as well. And imagine a brain tumor that you couldn't get a biopsy from being able to do it for that. That would be incredible. Yeah, and there's been some great work in CSF as well. Um, so yeah, the biology is there. How you measure it, you can really get quite creative. And yeah, in brain especially, I agree. All right, well, we're out of time. We're out of questions, but I want to thank you again. It was a great talk, really eye-opening. And I, I can't wait for the day when uh, you know, we can do this for, for all the kids that are diagnosed. Yeah, me too. Thanks a lot, Jay. And thanks everyone for the great questions. Really great discussion.